Chapter four, dialogic communication. So whenever we think of dialogic communication, we often think, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, die, right, two, so dialogic. Um, there's lots of things that we think of as communication, dialogic communication or conversational communication, but there, it's really not that simple. Um, and every day, every day we see on the news, people debating, people kind of trying to voice their thoughts and their opinions, not really listening. That's not dialogic communication. That's more like I just said, debate. Then there's the idea of monologue, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And that's one person talking, not really listening to others. Dialogic communication requires so much from us as a listener and the speaker. It's, it's both parts, right? It takes into account both people's feelings, their thoughts. Um, it's not assuming things about the other person. We'll talk all about that. But basically, dialogic communication is one of those things that sounds a lot easier than it actually is. So moving on, two things that we need to know about dialogic communication. It said it's both effective and respectful. So effective in that you are thinking a lot about your actions, what you're saying. Um, you're also thinking about what am I like, how am I viewing this conversation? What what's my perspective? Like it's very effective because you are putting so much effort into the process. Um, but it's also very respectful because it's something that we are putting again a lot of effort into. It's not to be strategic and get our way. It's actually trying to listen and see the other person as a human and that that's worth the same as we are and that we want to hear what they have to say. So we have those two concepts. It's both effective and respectful. Actually, I did want to read two. It says dialogue thus requires an openness to change and appreciation for the other person's perspective. That's on page 46 of the top. Um, I think that's important that we are understanding that we have to appreciate the other person in order for this to be considered dialogue. Otherwise, if we're always trying to just say what we want to say, it's not really a dialogue. All right, so the qualities of dialogue. There's four main qualities, and that's going to be civility, presentness, unconditional positive regard, and mutual equality. And each of these have some different aspects about them that we are going to cover. So the first one is civility. Um, civility, you know, we hear, hear the idea of like be civil. Um, this is learning how to treat others with respect. It doesn't necessarily just mean being passive or anything. It's talking about actually actively trying to be respectful both to others and ourselves. So the first part that we want to talk about is politeness. This is one of the fundamental parts of civil behavior. Um, again, we sometimes we think of politeness as just a nicety we have to do. But politeness is actually showing respect to others and it's thinking about the context in which we're in. So whenever we communicate, it always depends, how we communicate depends a lot on the context we're in, where we are, what we should be doing in that situation. And so when we are polite, we are understanding that certain people have expectations for those situations, for those contexts, and we're showing politeness. We're also showing uh, respect to culture, right? We're thinking about them, thinking about the other person. And a good way to think of politeness is also just basically the opposite of rudeness, right? It's someone that is polite is very, uh, they self-monitor. They think about what they say before they say it. They treat others kindly. Uh, rudeness is not caring about how you make people feel, what or how you do certain things, what you say. You're not doing any type of self-monitoring. And so we want to avoid that to be a competent communicator. That's going to be our goal for the class to become a competent communicator. We want to be polite. We want to think about things before we say it. And then um, there's this aspect of respecting others. So politeness leads straight into that. We're respecting others when we choose to be polite. Um, let me move, look at that real quick. So some things you want to think about, about respect, it says, Respect, this is on page 47. It says, respect does not mean subservience or difference, but rather an effort to understand another person and, acknowledge, and an acknowledgement of his or her ideas and presence. So this leads into what we'll talk about in a minute with mutual equality. Basically, respect is something that we do, like, um, in this, again, is polite, but politeness. But it's something like when someone's talking, we put our phones down. Right. If you've ever had experience where somebody is you're talking to someone and they, they do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That's very rude and it makes you feel like, oh, you don't really want to listen to me. Right. I, and 
I've had a, I have friends that, or I had a friend growing up who used to do that a lot. She also felt, always told me, oh, I'm just really good at multitasking. And you know, in the book, it talked about this science, this scientist who studied this. And he studied, it's like, he's a molecular biologist. So he studies molecules and he uh, specifically studied molecules within our brain. And he was talking about how the brain functions and how it works. And he was saying that it's physically impossible for our brain to completely focus on two things well. Your brain can do multiple things, but one thing that your brain is focused on will always take the forefront. So if someone's talking to you, right, and you just start getting on your phone, you're not respecting them, one, because you're not listening. That's not dialogic communication. You're not able to actually process what they're saying and process texting another person. You can't do both. Um, but that also obviously would be considered rude in our culture. And so if we were trying to be polite, politeness helps us be respectful to others by putting our phone down and putting it aside. And that's something that my husband and I really try to do when we go to dinner or anytime, which is us two, and we're spending time together. We always put our phone aside to say, let's spend some time together. One, to be polite, but then two, to have respect for one another and hear what each other have to say. So then the last thing is respect for yourself. So in order to be respectful to others, we also have to respect ourselves. And respect for ourselves has, has to do with assertiveness. A lot of times when we think of the word assertive, we think of kind of a, an aggressive behavior, but that's really not what assertive means. The book talks about assertiveness, and it says that assertiveness is the practice of clearly, calmly, and confidently making positions and ideas known to others. So you notice the part that says clearly, calmly, and confidently. So you are confident about what you believe and you are sharing that. You're not hiding what you think because that's not going to help. We'll talk about that some later as well. Um, so you're not hiding what you think. You're confidently sharing it, but you're calm about it. It's not forceful. It's not trying to force someone to agree with you. It's just sharing your opinion, sharing what you think, regardless of the outcome afterwards. When we do this, we're respectful to ourselves because it's not respect, like respectful to ourselves just to hide what we think and constantly just agree just to agree and not really be agreeing, right? So we're trying in a dialogic kind of communication situation to be both respectful to others and respectful to ourselves. Next comes presentness. So this is what I was talking about with the cell phone, making sure we put that cell phone down when people are, are talking to us. We have to give our full attention to others in order to be a good communicator. If we aren't paying attention, if we're allowing our head to be other places, there's no way that you can listen well. I'm really bad about, you know, if, you, if I'm ever texting, say my husband's saying something to me and I'm texting, or I'm trying to tell him something, I will end up writing what I hear or what I say. If you've ever done that, it's because you're, like I said, your brain really can't completely focus or function when two major things are going on. It can't focus on what this person's saying and then also completely focus on what I'm trying to say to this person, right? So we think about things like put your phone away, do whatever you have to do in order to be present in the conversation. Um, so again, like this says, you have to bracket out distractions. What are your distractions? What are the things that you tend to do when other people are talking? I, I really have tried to do a lot better about being present. A long time ago, actually, my husband um, told me, talked to me about this. He talked about my how bad I was at being present during conversations. When we were in college, uh, we dated for a little while in college, and that was one of the things that he kind of helped me with. We talked a lot about that and how I wasn't present in my friends' conversations. I talked a lot, but I didn't necessarily listen that well. And that was because I just I allowed my, every time someone else talked, I would just let my brain go other places. So we want to focus on the conversation, do what you have to do, especially if you think about this in a work-related situation. Um, you want to think about, and we'll talk about this in a minute, taking notes if you need to. How, how, what do I need to do in order to pay full attention to the presenter, to the person? Person, to my boss, to my coworkers, and that's really important. And again, this is really difficult to achieve, but it is a skill that we can develop, and it's something that, that means a lot to everybody. Like, it, you'll never say, man, I really didn't like how that person was really attentive when I spoke to them, <laughs> right? Usually, when you meet somebody that's actually truly present in the conversation and will talk with you and listen well, I mean, that's something that we will, we talk, I know that my husband and I, when we meet someone like that, we brag about that person to other people later on. Like, hey, this person was one of the nicest people I've ever met. He was just so, or she was just so attentive. She just was such a great listener. That's something that not a lot of people know how to do well. 
But when you do know how to do well, people recognize it and they really respect it. So then we have unconditional positive regard. So accepting others with a positive attitude. So this can, can be kind of scary for some people. If you're a person that's kind of skeptical of others, um, you kind of are weary about really engaging, communicating, getting to know people, sharing about yourself. This is what unconditional positive regard is saying. It's saying, you know, even though we have, all have our past experiences, we need to not apply past experiences to future conversations, to future situations or people. Think about the people that you meet, new people. We have to give some type of positive regard to that person. We have to assume the best about that person instead of assuming the worst. Now, in time, if the person proves themselves not to be a great person, we will ultimately, our positive regard for that person will diminish. It will go away. And like it says here, it involves taking risks. We have to trust that the other person in the conversation also respects us. Even though we are respecting them and we are sharing and we are open to that person, um, we are trusting that they're going to do that back. That might not always happen. And that's okay. I mean, you might get hurt a little bit because of that, but it's better than just assuming that everybody is kind of out to get you and, and not being willing to engage in communication with other people. And so this is, also doesn't mean that you have to accept what someone says. So say you're in a conversation with someone and they differ in opinion than you and you're talking about this. It doesn't mean just because you have like, an unconditional positive regard, it doesn't mean that you just have to accept everything that a person says. Um, you can have a difference of opinion. It's just being able to communicate about those things calmly and not force your thoughts on anybody, force them to agree with you and get into this debate type situation. You want to really try to listen and get them. Well, again, we'll talk about this in a second, but you want to try to find areas that we uh, you agree upon. And that's really going to help, but that doesn't mean you have to accept the end result that we both, that maybe we have different opinions, but how we got there, we can find some similarities, right? Um, so ultimately, when you are trying to have unconditional positive regard, you're just looking for what's best for both parties. You're trying to be respectful for both yourself and for others. Which then leads us to this idea of mutual equality. So mutual equality is looking at the people, anybody that we talk to and viewing them as being equal to us, to ourselves, right? We don't view anyone beneath us. We listen to people in a way that shows that we care, that we like see them as a human and that we are all we are the same level. Even if we have different, like if you're talking, you have your boss and your, your employee, at the core of who you are, you're both still humans and you both still matter. And so therefore we need to respect one another. I had a boss who was great at this. I mean, he, even though he was, he was my, uh, my dean, I guess, I was a high school teacher at this point. And he was so good at communicating with me in a way that, I mean, obviously I know he's my boss, but he communicated in a way that made me feel like he respected me just as much as anybody else and that I was at the same level as him. Right, like he didn't try to treat me like you're beneath me, I'm the principal, you're not, I'm in charge. He talked to me in a way that made me feel like he really cared about what I had to say. He listened to my viewpoints, even if maybe he didn't agree with some, some things, he always listened. He would find areas and say, okay, I can understand that, I get that point. Um, I still think this, but I get where you're coming from on that. And it always made me feel heard, like I was listening to, I always felt more encouraged leaving than I, like before I walked in. And that shows mutual equality. He viewed me as a person that was of equal value. He didn't see me as something less than. So things that we can do to, um, to encourage that within our interpersonal communication is to co collaborate on a solution. So collaborating means just like working together, not trying to do everything yourself, not trying to, like say you're working in a group for a group project. Try to honestly collaborate. You don't know, typically there's one person that always just kind of says, you know what, I'm gonna be a leader, I'm just gonna do it, whatever. Try to collaborate. I mean, I know it's hard to work in groups, but whenever you're in a group, really try to delegate, collaborate, get people's perspectives. I mean, you also want to share goals with others. So like if you're say you're the leader person, don't just do everything and hold everything in and then just tell people what to do. It's better to say, okay. Let's share and talk about all of our goals. Let's understand what we want to do. And then let's make a plan. Um, also, paraphrasing is a great way to ensure understanding and not in a belittling way, but truly actually paraphrasing to make sure you understand. So if someone says an idea to you, paraphrasing that back to them, saying, okay, so you're saying blank. By doing this, you're showing that you listened, 
but also you're trying to help yourself fully understand what they are trying to say. So what isn't dialogue? So I've talked about what is dialogue, but we have to understand kind of what are the what are the habits we want to avoid. So the first thing we want to avoid is monologue. And this doesn't mean that only one person's talking. It means that only one voice is heard. So if you know somebody, or even if you're honest with yourself, you might be this person that tends to enter in conversations with this idea that I like I know everything. You're not going to change my mind. And even if you don't really realize that, but maybe you go into a conversation and all of a sudden you just kind of plow over people when they're talking, or you know someone like this that just kind of plows over anybody else talking and continues to talk and really only respects their own voice. They might cut people off short, interrupt. They might not really care about what you have to say once you start talking, right? That is, that is a monologue. That is someone who is not actively trying to have a dialogue with anybody. So going back to that story of my husband in college, actually, so this is kind of embarrassing for me, but it's a good story and I learned a great lesson from it. But whenever we broke up in college, um, and one of the reasons my husband gave, so he, he was just kind of obviously just kind of bringing up with me, just saying like, you know, I just, this isn't working. And I said, well, what, like, what is one of the main issues that's going on? And he said, okay, Helen, you know, I know this isn't going to sound nice, but you're not a good listener. <laughs> I was like, what? He actually told me you're not very nice at first. I was like, what? I'm so nice. And he goes, yeah, you're nice, but you're, you're like, you don't really care about what other people have to say. Or anything. I go, what do you mean? I'm I'm really caring. And he said, okay, well, what's happening with your best friend, Kaylee? You know, what's happening with your other best friend, Holly? And I started thinking and I was like, well, what do you mean? And he goes, you don't know what's going on in their life because when you talk to them, you are the only person talking. When they talk, you don't listen. You're not a good listener. And it hit me so hard. I mean, I didn't let him know that. But after that conversation, I remember going inside and thinking on that and realizing, man, he's right. I am a really bad listener. And at that point, I guess I was 21 at the time. Since then, it's been a, an ongoing journey for me to, con to constantly remind myself, you don't need to be the only one speaking. Sometimes it's good to hold back. You, yes, it's great to talk and try to converse, but sometimes you need to be the person listening. So after that, I really made an effort to start calling my friends just to hear what they had to say, like saying, hey, what's going on in your life today? What's going on? And just listening to them. Um, and both of my friends both told me later on, like, man, I see a big change in you. And so that told me he was right. My husband was right. Or my boyfriend at the time, not my husband, was right. He saw something I didn't see about myself. So that's why I say sometimes it's hard, but we need to be honest with ourselves. Am I a monologue person? Am I the only person talking? Then there's the idea of debate. So this is kind of the idea, a little different idea. Uh, this, this is when uh, there's two parties and most people are talking but maybe somebody is a little bit more aggressive and is like competing to win an argument when there's no argument to be won, right? So um, my husband and I have a really good friend. He's been one of our good friends for a long time. But my husband, I remember my husband said one day, you know, sometimes I just get so exhausted. I love him so much, but sometimes I get exhausted because, you know, you can say to him, man, this guy's really, oh, really bright blue today. And He's going to say, actually, it looks more of a gray. It's like a grayish tone. And you're like, come on, man. Do you, why, why do you have to say that? Like, why do you have to argue about something that's so minute, right? That's like this argument kind of debative personality. And some of us are inherently like that. I'm not necessarily like that, but I definitely see how our friend, it's not that he even really thinks about it. It's just how he communicates. He's like, well, actually, or he always says that, like, well, maybe it's this way. Or he always has something kind of to say and wants it to be, wants you to listen to his ideas and agree with him. And when, when we're not careful, we can kind of fall into this trap, you know, especially if we're talking about something that we're passionate about. Like I'm really passionate about foster care and adoption. Like I'm, I'm adopted. I was briefly in the foster care system. Like I am just passionate about that. Now I have to understand that not everybody else, while everyone think, obviously knows that's a good thing, not everyone else is going to be as passionate as I am. And if I'm not careful, sometimes when I'm in, in situations where I'm, you know, talking with somebody, I'll just start really trying to force that on somebody and trying to get them to, to say like, oh, I should adopt, I should foster. Yeah, and that's not something for me 
to push on some. I shouldn't debate with them on this. It's something that I can communicate with them and talk to them about and have a dialogic communication type conversation with them. But my ultimate goal should just be to share my thoughts, hear their thoughts, and not force any one end point, right? Any trying to force them to agree with me. That's not going to really help. Nobody really likes a debate of personality trying to force them into agreement. Um, dialogic communication really helps because it allows both people to be open-minded and to see the other person's point of view and ultimately come up with a better understanding of one another. So we want to avoid being doing a monologue, you know, being the monologue type person. We also want to avoid being the debative person, the person that's always trying to have a debate, um, and especially about things that don't matter, right? All right, so then we have attitudes necessary for dialogue. So the first thing, so these are those are the things that we don't need to do. Here's what we do in order to be good at dialogue. First, we need open-mindedness. So again, this is when we are we are open to what someone else has to say. We don't come up with our own idea of what they're going to say or what we think they're going to say. Um, we try to listen to it. So again, talking about that whole idea of me being passionate about foster care and adoption. When I, if I'm trying to be open-minded to another person, it doesn't mean that I have to allow that person to change what I believe on that. Like you're never going to change that in my mind, right? That's one of my core values. Uh, but I can be open-minded in that I can hear where they're coming from on their side. Say if they are not to a point where they feel like they feel comfortable with fostering or adopting, or, or maybe they're just generally just kind of learning about it or wanting to know more about it. Um, I want to be open to what they have to say about why they are, aren't or are open to it. Open-mindedness allows us to have this really open conversation where we're both respecting one another, we care about one another, we aren't pressuring, we aren't making anybody feel uncomfortable. Open-mindedness allows both of us to grow. And especially even on things that maybe aren't as obvious, maybe as foster care and adoption, it might be something more basic, but just hearing someone else's point of view and not trying to assume what their viewpoint is, is really important and it allows both people to feel calm in the situation, allows both people to have a good conversation. I have a good friend of mine, she and I, I feel like are both really great at having open-minded conversations with one another. Like we, a lot of times we don't agree on everything, but we talk about it and I never once feel uh, angry or like I'm trying to debate and win this argument. It's always just more like, we're just trying to think about this. How can we view this? Or, you know, like we're growing through the conversation and it's a great feeling to have just a conversation with someone without feeling pressured into anything. And um, then there's genuineness. So this has to do with kind of going back to that idea of respecting yourself. In order to be genuine, we have to respect ourselves. We have to respect our own opinions. And we don't just need to come up, like just try to pretend that we agree with what everyone's saying. Um, genuine, like, cause people think of genuine as being, oh, they're just uh, being really nice, you know? And kind of like this also with this idea of agreeableness. We're thinking about just agreeing and agreeing, like that's what I need to do. Like nobody needs a yes man, you know? Like it's not that concept. Genuineness, is the idea that what I say is truly what I mean. And I, I'm not trying to manipulate. I'm not trying to um, pretend I'm a different way. It's just genuine in what you are talking about. This again, this goes with that, um, this, that positive regard for other people, unconditional positive regard. When we have unconditional positive regard for everybody, we want, when we're in that communication situation, we wanna be genuine with them. We wanna share who we truly are because if you think about longevity wise, if you're in a relationship and you're just pretending to be someone you're not, if you are saying things that really don't go with your core values or make you a little uncomfortable or whatever, you're never going to have a real conversation. And it's honestly unfair for the other person you're in the relationship with. I mean, if you're always just pretending to agree with them and it really goes against who you are and you're not being genuine, they are either in love or are friends with another a person that's really not who they think they are, right? That's not fair. That's not being genuine for that person. And ultimately, that will catch up in the relationship. Either you'll get tired of pretending to be someone you're not, or that person will figure out that you're really not who you say you are, and that's going to damage the relationship. So genuine, genuineness from the get-go is extremely important. And then you have agreeableness. So agreeableness, again, that's not just saying yes to everything. Agreeableness is trying to find an area where you both can see 
eye to eye on something. Even if you, the, the outcome and like ultimately you view things differently, you're seeing that you both have the same heart for something. So a good idea would be if my husband and I are talking about schools for our son, I mean, I, I, way in advance, say that I want to go to private school and he doesn't. I mean, I don't know what I want to do, but say that's that's the, that's the case. Like I, I'm saying I want him to go to private school and he's like, no, you know, I went to public school, we should do that. And we both are so focused on getting the other person to agree with the end goal that, we, that he should go to private school or he should go to public school that we can't understand how we got there in the first place. Agreeableness is not agreeing with him and just saying, okay, fine, we can, he can go to public school or him agreeing with me and saying, fine, he can go to private school. It's more so seeing on the way there, how did we get there? You know, ultimately we are both just wanting the best for our son, whether that is, you know, we want him to have just more versatile experiences or we want him to have the best education possible or, you know, like just whatever those things ultimately boil down, we both want the same thing. We're just both wanting what's best for him. And so if I can see that, it allows me to not be angry in this situation, right? Like by being agreeable, I am finding that core value in this argument with my husband, argument, but this conversation with my husband, seeing his side of it, because I understand that we both ultimately are wanting the same things. When we find something we can both agree upon, because we always can, there's always something you can agree upon. Um, whenever you find that, it makes the whole conversation so much better, so much easier. And it actually leads to more of a dialogic communication style than a debate style conversation. All right, and then we have ethical integrity. So ethical ethics basically have to do with our morals. So what's right and what's wrong. And so this is going to change depending on culture. But ultimately, there are some basic rules, I think, that you could say no matter where you go in the world, this would be stand true, such as if you were are walking down a hallway at school at, at Plasti Tech, if you're walking down the hallway, probably not the best idea just to punch someone for no reason. I mean, just walking down like, hey, I feel like punching that person. Bam, punch. Obviously, that's not going to be great. It's not how you should do things. Now, that doesn't matter wherever you are in the world, still not going to be OK. Right. So we have these ideas of certain morals that are right and wrong and treating people poorly, putting people down. Um, speaking down to people, being rude, those kind of things, that's part of ethics. That's part of our ethics. As a good, as a competent communicator, it is up to us to uphold these morals or these ethics, right? We have to say, I'm not going to talk about these things. Or I'm not going to treat somebody this way through my communication because this is morally not something I stand for, which then leads us to the idea of integrity. Integrity is upholding your morals regardless of the situation or the context. So it doesn't matter if you are with a big group of people or if you're just one person, you will treat both people respectively. A good way to look at this is say you are, how you talk to maybe your significant other or a parent or a brother or sister, someone you're super close to, um, say how you talk to them sometimes. You would probably never talk to just like to me, your professor probably would never talk to me that way. Why? Because in this situation, all you have is have this integrity to uphold these ethics. But in this situation, you have allowed your your integrity to kind of diminish a little bit. I'm guilty of it too, not just you. I do it right. So we have to think about uphold it. Being a very a competent communicator means that regardless of the situation, regardless of who I'm talking to, I will uphold my morals on how I choose to talk to people and how I choose to treat people and in a conversation. So that's something that we need to think about. I, that's something that convicted me this time. I have to think about this a lot recently. If I'm not, if I wouldn't say this to a stranger, if I wouldn't act like this towards my grandmother, probably shouldn't treat my husband this way or say these kinds of things to my husband. Right. So just think about that as you move forward. So some dialogic behaviors that we want to focus on. Um, first and foremost, we want to separate facts from interpretation. So a lot of times we interpret things. Remember last time or last chapter, we talked about interpretation. That's like the end process of perception. We perceive something, we organize it, and then we interpret it. So a lot of times we take this interpretation and we believe that it's truth because this is our truth. But we have to remember that perception is each of our own truths, right? We can both perceive the same thing, but perceive it differently. Therefore, we have different truths. 
uh, or different facts. So we cannot look at interpret or interpretation as a fast factual evidence. For example, if you um, say you went to an insurance company and it, they said your car insurance would be $170. That is a fact, okay? Or, and you're telling somebody about this, this car insurance place, it costs $170 for um, car insurance, fact. Or you could say it as this car insurance place is really expensive. That's interpretation. That's not necessarily fact, that is interpretation. So you, you see the difference, one is a fact, what is interpretation that we have come to know as fact? So as we're talking with people, we have to understand that our interpretations that aren't actually factual. So sometimes it might be good to say, in my experience, or I believe, or something that I see it, or I see it as, you know, by putting those little hedgers in front or putting something in front to let the other person know that I'm not saying this is the absolute truth. You may see this differently, but this is how I've experienced it, and this is how I interpret it. And then ask clarifying questions. So clarifying questions, again, this is not to belittle people or because uh, sometimes you think about if you've ever been in maybe an argument with somebody, you'll kind of ask clarifying questions that are kind of belittling the situation or not. They're not really helping the situation and just puts the person on the defensive. Uh, we want to avoid that. We want to ask questions that are actually going to enhance the conversation. We're going to help the conversation, even if it's something that maybe we don't agree upon. So maybe your friend likes to spend a lot of money that she doesn't need to, she or he doesn't need to spend on clothes. You know, if you're having this conversation with them, it wouldn't be the best idea to say, um, why, so you think it's okay to spend money on that when you have all these other bills to pay? How is that going to be taken, right? Even if you feel that way, that the person's going to take that as defensive and they're going to probably just declare clear that conversation with you. Really a good way to do that, if you really want to make them think about it and talk about it, would be more so to say, so how much money are you going to have after you buy that? And ask them to talk with you about it because that's going to be better than trying to force them into a corner and making them feel like, oh, like they're, they're trying to attack me in this. So whenever you ask questions, ask yourself first, is this question sounding like I'm attacking or does it sound like I'm just trying to have an honest conversation with them? And then out, allowing others to speak fully. Sometimes we like to cut people off just to show support. Like it's not, sometimes it's not even bad. Sometimes in an argument, we cut people off because we, you know, we get all heated up and we just think we know what the other person's saying. So we just mm, want to get our thoughts in. Um, Obviously that's not good, but sometimes we do this in just everyday conversations. Like say your friend's telling you how they feel about something and you're listening, you're trying to be supportive. And so then you try to finish their sentence. That's okay sometimes, but sometimes we get in the habit of doing it so often that it's really not helpful. It's actually harmful to the conversation. It's not allowing the person you're talking to to fully express themselves. We shouldn't assume we know exactly what the person's saying. Um, we should let them talk and then communicate back and forth about that. So, I mean, again, every now and then, but if you're doing it all the time, it's something we kind of need to rein in. And then also taking notes. So again, this is a great thing to do in a, if you're at work and you're like, okay, so at my old high school, I used to work at every Wednesday, we had a um, staff meeting. So during lunch, we'd all come into the staff meeting unless you had staff, you know, lunch duty or something, but you came in there and you listened to our Dean talk about whatever it is for that week that we needed to hear about. And, you know, it used to make fly all over me when everybody in the place, and this kind of goes into what we were talking about for the next thing too, giving her complete attention. But it would fly all over me when people would be on their tech, on their phones texting, they would be literally talking to one another and not even listening to our principal. And I would just think, guys, like you would get so mad if your students did this to you. Why are you not listening? And so one of the things that I tried to do just to show respect and show that I was listening um, was to take notes. You know, I often took notes because one, I, for, I, I forget things, so I have to take notes. I, if you ever come up to me in class and tell me something you'll notice, I always write it down because I just have to write things down. But taking notes, one, shows that you were respecting what the other person's saying. Two, it helps you to remember. But three, it also helps you to focus. It helps you to not be distracted by other things because you are listening and you are trying to comprehend everything that this person's saying and remember it. So taking notes, especially in a business situation, obviously in class, but in certain specific situations, that's a great tactic to, to, tactic to try to use. And then there's giving your complete attention. So again, what are the things that distract you? 
Are you a person who likes to hop on their phone every time someone talks? Put the phone, phone away, right? If you are someone who likes to talk a lot, if you're sitting with people, sit separately. I'm, I'm a person, I am a talker. I'm, not, I'm obviously, y'all know this already, but I am a talker. So I'm the kind of person that will sit. If you sit next to me, I will end up talking to you the whole time instead of listening to what's going on. So I got to a point, both in college and at work, that yes, I will talk to everybody when we're in the hallways and we're hanging out and the, and the given situation. But in a staff meeting, I tended to sit by myself because I knew I, I, I won't listen if I don't do it. So give your complete attention, whatever that takes. And then owning your statements. So that means basically changing your statements from you statements to I statements. Like one, I, when I read owning your statements, I think like own, own what you have to say. But really this is saying own what you're trying to say, own what you're trying to communicate. Like instead of saying you do this, say I feel this way. So like, hold on, let me go let me give you some examples that I thought were really good. So on page 58, it gives you a table of you and I language and it says, um, you never let me finish. Okay, you never let me finish. Obviously, that sounds more like combative, right? You never let me finish. Or you could say, I have not fully explained myself. Like, hold on, I haven't fully explained myself. And doing that, you are being calm, collected. You are allowing the, actually, I like the way that the book says it, so I'll read this sentence to you. It said, each of the I statements focuses on the speaker and illustrates his or her ability to be in touch with emotions and feelings and express them in a way that does not attack the other party. It's, it's a way that you show people that I yeah, I know what I'm talking about and it, it keeps you in control of your emotions instead of this becoming this heated battle. Having, saying I statements, like that I haven't fully expressed myself is not giving the other person control, but it's saying I'm in control of myself and my emotions and I'm able to talk to you about this. Like I need to finish explaining, let me talk about this. And that is going to allow you to be a better communicator because you're not putting the other person on the defensive where they feel like they're being attacked. But instead, you're just saying, hey, I can't just I can't do anything about what you're doing, but I can control what I'm doing. And this is how I feel. Right. So that is dialogic behaviors and dialogic communication in a nutshell.